The book of Psalm 19 and verse number 1. I, I want to say one last thing before I preach. This is from my heart. From my heart. Thank you for being a part of this church. I told you of my affection for the African people. I've had the opportunity the last few days to be in Bahrain and Qatar. If it were not for the independent Baptist from the Philippines, the gospel would not be being preached hardly at all in this place. The backs, the backs of the Filipinos have borne the gospel to places that are hard to reach. Many of my African brothers over here that have received Christ would have come to Qatar and never heard the gospel had it not been for your commitment to preaching it in this place. And so I thank you as an American that uh, enjoys people that sacrifice for the gospel's sake. Your labor is not in vain Amen. in the Lord. The book of Psalm 19, look at verse number 1. I'll read verse 1, and then if you'll join me in the reading of verse 2, we'll read responsibly down to verse number 4. Psalm 19, verse 1 says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth His handiwork. Verse 2, ready? Day unto day, our speech, and night unto night, showeth knowledge. There is no speech, nor language, where their voice is not heard. Verse 4. Their lives come out to all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them hath he set a firmament of the sun. Now before I pray, let me say this about these four verses. Every time that an unsaved man looks at the stars, they're preaching a sermon to him. The sermon is, there is a God. And you're going to give account to that God. Every time the sun comes up in the morning, God is using nature to teach us the truth of God's Word. Amen. God uses the trees. Even the rocks would cry out. God uses the natural, listen to me, to teach us something about the supernatural. God uses things around us circumstances and nature to teach us about himself even in the creation of man in the book of Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26 God said and let us make man in our image after our likeness and so God created Adam and he put Adam together of three parts the body, the soul, and the spirit. But he made one man. He made a three. The image of God. The image of God. Let us, plural, make man in our, plural, image. After our likeness, plural. So God created man and then used the creation of man to teach us about the Trinity. Father, Son and Holy Ghost. By the way, this is not the sermon, but this is why you should use the King James Bible. Amen. Because the modern versions of the Bible detract from the Trinity. Amen. 1 John 5, 7, There are three that bear record in heaven, the Father and the Word and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Amen. This is not found in the NIV. Amen. It's not found in the American Standard. Amen. It's not found in the Good News for Modern Man. It's not found in the Revised Standard Version. And I'll go further. In most African translations, it's not found. The verse is completely omitted and deleted from Scripture. And their answer, it wasn't in the originals. As if someone that wrote that has ever seen the originals. The truth is, you must believe the Word of God is inspired and preserved. Amen. And anything
anything less than the King James Bible is a compromised, corruptible seed. Amen. And so today, God takes uh, the natural to teach us about the supernatural, to teach us about Himself. Today, this morning, I want to take the next 30 minutes or so, and I want to talk to you about the blood of Jesus and how that God takes our blood and teaches us about His blood. I'm calling this sermon the DNA of the Gospel. Would you bow your heads for prayer, please? Our Father, these next few moments, would you please quiet our hearts and help us to listen on purpose to the Scriptures. I pray, Lord, that you would take these next few moments and, and cause us to appreciate as believers the blood of Jesus Christ. And cause us that are maybe not saved to run into the name of Christ and find refuge. Quiet our hearts, encourage the, the believer, and save the unbeliever. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. You may be seated. Now, please listen to me as I try to teach you something from the, from the Scriptures. Every one of us in this room that's an adult has between four and five liters of blood running throughout your body. That blood is a miraculous thing. God has gifted us our blood system to help us in so many ways. Scientists did not know much about the blood system until just a couple of hundred years ago. But the Bible teaches us much about the blood of human beings. Every one of us have three parts, three main parts to our blood system. We have our red blood cell. We have what's called, these are layman terms, we have our white blood cells. And then we have what we call in the English our platelets. Those are the three main parts of every human being's blood system. So, the red blood cell, what does it do? What does your body's red blood cells accomplish? What's the purpose? So everyone take your hand and put it here on your stomach. Now, if you don't have a big stomach like you, like me and Brother Cleo, you may not be able to visualize this as much. But you take a deep breath in, ready? Now hold it, hold it. Now let it out. Let's try again. This, this is good exercise. Ready? Now when you breathe in, you breathe in air, and in that air was what? Oxygen. Good. You're a good class. You breathe in oxygen. When you exhaled, you exhaled. Oh, now you're picking up. Uh -huh. so, so by breathing in oxygen, here's what happened. The oxygen came into your lungs, and from your lungs it went into the blood system. Now your heart's pumping that blood. So the, so the red blood cells travel all over your body, every part of your body. And the red blood cells are vehicles to distribute oxygen. That's the main purpose of the red blood cell. They're distributing oxygen. You see, without oxygen running into every part of your body, something will begin to die. Something will begin to die. For example, if you don't have blood running into your foot, like in a diabetic, you have diabetes right here. You don't have blood running into your foot. The doctors will begin to try to treat with medicine. But oftentimes, as a result of the blood vessels not allowing the blood to run into the foot anymore, no oxygen goes to the foot. And as a result, the foot will have to be amputated. Maybe if that doesn't work, the knee will have to be amputated. Eventually, the whole leg. So you meet people that have diabetes and oftentimes if changing their diet and 
taking different medicine don't help, you'll see part of their limbs are missing. We had one brother in our church in Florida that had severe diabetes. He was an older man. So at one point, the doctor cut off maybe two or three toes. And then another time, they cut off another couple of toes. And then eventually they cut off his foot, and then eventually his, his legs. My father went to see him one day, and he said, Pastor, I think I'm going to heaven one piece at a time. <laughs> but your body has to have oxygen to survive. In fact, outside of oxygen, there's no life. There's no life. You see, the red blood cells bring life. The red blood cells bring life. The Bible says the life of the flesh is in the... So your body... God told us that, that every part of life that happens in your body happens because of the blood. The red blood cells. The first president in America was George Washington. In his later years, he came down with a, with a fever. And in those days in America... They practiced the practice, the medical doctors practiced what was called bloodletting. Where they would take a, a razor, if you had a fever, and they'd cut one of your arteries. Thinking that as your body was releasing the blood, it was going to release the bacteria and the fever. What they didn't know is that if you lose your blood, you're going to die. So George Washington didn't die from the fever, he died from bleeding to death. Think about that. The truth is, every single one of us, in order to sustain life, must have these red blood cells traveling about our bodies because our, our blood system carries life. Now what does that have to do with the blood of Jesus? Listen, without the blood of Jesus, there is no life. Amen. The life, I'm talking about John chapter 10 and verse number 10, Jesus said, I am come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. The giver of life is Jesus. Amen. John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. You see, religion can never bring you eternal life. Amen. Being conformed or reformed will never bring you life. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what you try to do to fix yourself or to have some man-made repair done to your life. There is no sustained life outside of the blood of Jesus. Amen. My father, when he got saved in 1967, he went to church and he had not been in a church house, Brother Cleo, for 12 years. My father was raised in a home that was dysfunctional. In the 1950s, before there was divorce in America, my grandparents had already been separated three times and finally been divorced. My father's from a family of 11 children, and his mother raised them until she injured herself, breaking her hip, and the children were sent away to an orphanage. And my father grew up in an orphanage in Arkansas, in the state of Arkansas, and as a young boy, his heart was filled with hatred and anger and bitterness because life was not fair, and he became an adult, and he took his vengeance out on everybody that he met, including my mother. And they were living in open adultery in 1967 and had no interest in the things of God had not been in a church for a funeral or a marriage or a service in 12 years. But a Baptist preacher came by and knocked on his door and invited him to a revival. And he came to the revival with my mother. And on the second night of that revival, he trusted Christ as his Savior. Amen. And God gave him life and life abundant. You see, if you're here this morning, and, and you're not saved, you're looking around at these people, and you're wondering in your mind maybe now, what's wrong with these people? They're laughing, and they're playing with one another, and they're singing to enjoy themselves, and, and they sing when they sing to sing from their heart, and you're sitting there saying, where does this come from? See, this is not natural. 
What you're doing underground here, downstairs from some kitchen, is not natural to the unsaved mind. But you see, when you get saved, God changes you from the inside out. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. And that change does not come because you were admitted to a rehab clinic. Or because you ended up going to some place and becoming reformed. That change came because of the blood of Jesus. Amen. It's the blood of Jesus that gives life. These red blood cells, they transport life. Number two, the white blood cells. The white blood cells. What do the white blood cells do? Not the same as the red blood cells. The white blood cells are put in my body by God so that if I develop a sickness within, they're my immune system. They're my heavenly antibodies, my antibiotics. So if I have an infection down here, the white blood cells, they rush to that place and they begin to fight the infection. They heal me of my inner diseases. What does the blood of Jesus do? All of us in this room have an inner disease called sin. It comes in different forms. Some of you might have a problem being a habitual liar. You don't lie all the time, but when it's convenient. The pastor comes to see you and says, we missed you in church last Friday. You were watching television on Friday. You were home watching football. But now the pastor puts you on the spot and says, where were you last Friday? And you said, oh, I had some things I had to do for my family. As if maybe doing this is helping your family as you use the remote control. And so you lie. You're, you're, you're used to lying to the pastor and to your wife or to your children. You're used to lying to the bill collector. You're used to lying to your employer. And that sin is inside of you. It's in your heart. Some of you that live in this place, you struggle with the sin of lust. Looking at other women, lusting after them. All over America, there are men trapped in pornography and addiction, gambling, drunkenness. And so we take the drunkard off the street and we put him in detox. We put him in some program for 40 or 60 days while his body dries out. We send him to classes and he sits around in circles and looks at his fellow drunkards. They tell stories about how they make poor decisions and how they're alcoholics. They try to somehow prop themselves up by positive thinking, changing their environment, doing things that they can do to change themselves. And yet at the end of the day, a man without Jesus who's a drunkard will go right back to drinking. The Bible says that a, that a dog will return to his vomit and a swine to the mire. I mean, you can take a dog and you can bathe him real well and put a ribbon around his neck and wash him and spray a little bit of cologne or perfume, smell good stuff on him, and you can send him right back out the door and he's going to look for something else like trash to dig in or the dirt and the mud to dig in. Or if he, he sees a sore on a human being, he licks it with his tongue. But you see, what's wrong with the dog is that he has the nature of a dog. It's in his nature to be filthy. And what's wrong with an unbeliever is they don't have the nature of God living within them. They don't have the blood of Jesus. They don't have forgiveness of sins. They don't have the Spirit of God. Romans 9 verse 8 says, If any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he's none of his. And you can take an unbeliever, and you can put him in a rehab clinic, you can put him in a hospital, you can send him to Alcoholics Anonymous, you can try to clean him up by putting him in a perfect environment, and eventually he'll be right back in the same mess. 
Because he doesn't have the blood of Jesus. And all over the world, there are people that write helps books and life skills books and they're on the radio and televisions trying to give people hope for a better life. And yet, if they don't acknowledge the blood of Jesus, they'll all lead to the same place. A hopeless and wasted future. Jesus met a man in the Gospels were called, he's called the maniac of the Gadarenes or of Gadara. That man was a demon possessed man. He wandered about in cemeteries, enthralled, captivated by death, laid in the cemeteries at night, howling like a wild man, like Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. That man took his clothes off and ran up and down the streets of Gadarenes. That man threw himself into fire. He cut his body and made markings on his flesh. He tried to drown himself. He was a half crazy man. If women walked down the street with their children and saw the maniac coming, they grabbed their small children and rushed to the other side of the street. Nobody wanted to associate with him. All his family had given him time and time and time again to try to fix himself. And after spending all of their substance to try to repair this man, they realize it's hopeless. And then one day he met Jesus. And Jesus did what the psychologist could not do. And Jesus did what the psychiatrist and the drugs could not do. And Jesus did what all the counseling could not do. And all the therapy could not do. In one moment, the blood of Jesus Christ applied to the sins of the maniac of Gadara. And he was seated at the feet of Jesus. And he was clothed. And the Bible says he was in his right mind. Amen. Thank God for the blood of Jesus. Amen. Thank God for the blood of Jesus. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. What you need is not religion. You need the blood of Jesus. You don't need just a pep talk and encouragement. You need the blood of Jesus. If you're not saved, I implore you, I beg of you, don't walk back up these stairs and out these doors today without knowing the blood of Jesus. The blood has been applied for your sins or has been shed for your sins. The blood has been shed on Calvary to pay for your sins, but the blood must be applied. You can accept Jesus Christ as your Savior today and He'll take the precious blood of Christ and apply them to all of your sins and He'll never remember them again. Thank the Lord for the blood of Christ. There's power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. Thank God for the blood of Jesus. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow. That makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. In the Yoruba language in southwestern Nigeria, they sing it this morning. Kilo lewe sheminu kosi leine jejesu. And that is that the blood of Jesus Christ alone can cleanse you and forgive you of your sins. The blood of Jesus is represented by our red blood cells because our red blood cells give life. The red blood cells or the white blood cells, they fight off inner diseases. And the blood of Jesus fights off the very sinful diseases that, in, that, in, that entail our entire existence. It's the blood of Christ that heals us from within. And then thirdly, I said I'd come to it, the platelet. Now what does that do? Well, the platelets are given to us by God. They're a little hard to explain. But they help our blood to clot. They cause clotting in the blood. For example, if you, if you cut your hand or something and you begin to bleed, if your platelets are there, it will cause the bleeding to stop. Because they rush to that place where you've been wounded. 
and it will give healing to that place. Eventually that place will scab over. Use the word scab. And it's the platelets that causes this. You could say it this way, the, the platelets, they heal us of our outer wounds. Our outer wounds. When I was just a small boy, I remember when my mother and father bought me my first bicycle. Maybe the age of six or seven. Oh, I was so proud of that bicycle. I went out on the street and tried to learn to ride it. It took me some time. But once I figured out how to balance myself on that bicycle, I was so proud. I tried to do it with one hand, wave to my friends. Sometimes I'd get out on that bicycle, I'd do no hands like this. But I was six or seven years of age, and I remember as if it was yesterday, Brother Jamar, I remember, I remember going down the street on my bicycle and losing control. Maybe the steering wheel caught a rock or sand or something. And the bike went like this and I went this way. And I landed on that cement or on that asphalt. And all of a sudden I, I looked at my hands and, and I was bleeding on my hands. And I had blood on one of my knees. I can remember jumping up and, and just seeing this blood as a small boy and being horrified. I ran back to my house crying all the way. Mama, 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 mama. I wonder why it is when we get hurt, we never cry, Daddy, 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 Daddy. <laughs> but I didn't. I ran in the house, Mama, 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 Mama. And she set me down. What happened? What happened? Uh, uh, ooh, 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 ooh. I hurt my knee. She looked at it. Oh. She got a washcloth with some water, warm water, and she wiped the blood off. Ooh, 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 ooh. And she blew up. <laughs> She got some ointment. She put that ointment down on that knee so gently. She took a band-aid and covered up that knee. Oh, it felt good now. In five or ten minutes, I had forgotten. I was back out riding my bicycle. <laughs> Maybe a week passed or two weeks. The band-aid's gone. I'm sitting outside one day, Brother Cleo, and I see this place on my knee. Dark, hard scab, ugly. Boys are very curious. I don't want this on my leg anymore. So I start picking at it. I pull off the scab and it starts to bleed again. Oh, mommy, 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 mommy. I run inside the house, I'm bleeding. She sets me down. Wipes the blood off, puts ointment on, puts a band-aid on, and she says, now, Timmy, don't touch it. Don't touch it. I learned the truth. When you're wounded, don't touch it. You see, my friend, in this room, as your Sunday school or Friday school lesson was about injustice, Someone in your life has wounded you. I'm talking maybe to some mother who's raising their children while your husband has abandoned you. I may be talking this morning to a young woman back in your childhood. Some man may have put his hands upon you and molested you. Maybe an uncle or stepbrother or stepfather. Someone in your life, in many of your lives, have wounded you far beyond the wound of a little boy riding a bicycle, but has wounded your soul. The deepest scars that you will ever have will not be upon your body, but be within on your soul. It was a familiar friend that betrayed the Son of God. It was the great pain that Judas afflicted upon our Savior that caused the greatest stains 
on the Savior's soul. The greatest pain that Jesus endured was not the crown of thorns or the nails within His hands and feet, but was the betrayal by those that were His familiars. And I'm talking to people in this room that have struggled throughout their adulthood with people that have abused you, have forgotten you, have forsaken you, have done you wrong, and they left in God and lived their own life. And there you are this morning, picking up the pieces. Wondering at times, God, why did you allow this to happen to me? Lord, I didn't deserve this, oh God. I'm talking to people this morning that have gone throughout your life and faced trials and, and torments and heartaches that were not even caused by your own poor decision, but they were laid upon you by the sins of others. We live in a perverse and an evil world where human beings do unimaginable things to one another. And yet, the blood of Jesus can heal us of our outer wounds. The only thing that can ever help you to find comfort and peace in a troubled world is the blood of Jesus Christ. You say, Pastor, I've tried to forget about it. I've tried to put it aside. I've come to an altar and I've knelt down on my knees and I've asked the God of heaven to help me to forgive that one. I've asked the Lord of heaven to help me to find a way forward. And yet every step I take, I'm reminded of the scars of my childhood. I'm reminded of the loneliness I felt. And I can't seem to get the victory. And I come to you this morning and I plead with you. On behalf of our Savior. Who said in Isaiah 53. With his stripes we are healed. Healing does not come. Because of personal strength. Healing comes. Because of Jesus blood. The great heartaches of my life have not been overcome because I was stronger than the next. Because I had more willpower than the other person. The great peace and joy I find in my heart this morning 